could the legacy of the coronavirus pandemic be seen in our architecture? That's on today's homemade edition of Showcase. So, to tell us how COVID-19 has affected the industry, we have Jack Balderama Morley, Managing Editor of The Architects newspaper. Hi, Jack. So, what way is the industry hit the most uh, so far? So far, I think the industry has been hit most by construction slowdowns, construction pauses, and because that workflow has slowed, that means that a lot of employees have gone on furloughs or have been laid off. Um, so it's been pretty widespread, that impact. Mm. So are we talking about construction site workers only, or are we also talking about um, other professionals in the industry? It's stretched across the whole industry. So construction workers have lost their job or lost work in this period, but it's also architects. Um, I think consultants and engineers have also seen uh, furloughs and work stoppages. Uh, yeah, so it's gone across the whole uh, architecture, engineering, construction industry. And how do you think the industry is facing this? I mean, is enough being done about people who are being laid off or furloughed at the moment? Uh, that's an open question if enough is being done. Um, it does seem like, you know, firms are trying to minimize the impact and they're trying to retain workers as much as possible with hopes that the work will return in the summer or in the fall. Um, but, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen. So there's only so much I think that firms can really do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you feel like uh, the situation is just for construction site workers at the moment in terms of I mean, are they uh, are they secured by law or are they, I don't know, uh, what kind of a situation are they in and how do you feel about this? I think construction workers are in a pretty precarious situation for a variety of reasons. Um, one of which being that a lot of construction workers were still working on sites uh, throughout the whole pandemic and are still working and there weren't a lot of safety measures put in place. So I think construction sites were dangerous in terms of um, as being sites where you could potentially get the virus just by being at your job. Mm -hmm. And that's on top of construction already being an extremely dangerous uh, industry and profession. Um, so I, I do think construction workers have been hit pretty hard by this. Mm -hmm. And how about the smaller architectural firms, for example, and compared to bigger ones or the major ones, how do you compare their situation? Well, small firms have been able to apply for uh, the payroll protection program loans uh, available to uh, firms with employees fewer than 500 employees, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been trying to navigate that. I don't know that they've all been successful. A lot of those loans haven't come through. Um, but obviously, a lot of those small firms are... are uh, more at risk than the larger ones, which, you know, have um, more cash reserves to draw on. The small firms, some of them, you know, are more month to month in terms of cash flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to talk about how uh, how architecture will be affected by COVID-19. I mean, we can speculate about it, but there is just one point that I want to raise before that. How do you think um, the current housing system uh, sort of influenced the spread of the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, that's a good question. I think in dense cities like New York, particularly, um, because housing is so expensive, people are forced into cramped spaces. You know, families are living in small apartments. You have roommates living on top of each other. And I think that's really influenced um, how the virus has spread. It's exacerbated this mm -hmm. whole situation. Um, so I think, yeah, a lack of uh, affordable housing, a lack of sizable housing has really made the crisis worse. And what does it say about the industry? I mean, in general, I mean, are we designing for human behavior and are we designing for, for human beings, really, or only for the sake of aesthetics? That's a good question. I think the industry is really bound a lot by economics and um, the real estate market in the city and the real estate market in major cities in, in the US is 
so competitive, everything is super expensive, and there's not a lot of government regulation to create more affordable housing for people. So I think a lot of architects are, are working within a system um, that doesn't provide a lot of flexibility. Jack Baldarama Morley, it was good to have you. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much. So, the architecture firm WTA believes that the design of our living spaces is an integral facet to our health. And to tell us more about this is the firm's principal architect, William T. Hi, William. So, uh, you are creating short-term relief spaces at the moment. This is, uh, this is something that you came up with after the COVID-19 crisis, of course. Tell us about them. Um, so, I think uh, about 45 days ago, about a month and a half ago, we were getting these um, letters being re or statements being released by various hospitals in our country. And they were saying how they can no longer accept patients. Um, the hospitals were running full to capacity. And so me and my friend, who's a doctor, we were just talking and we just kind of like thought about like how the best way for us to help in this pandemic is for us to be able to augment the capacity of these hospitals. And it just so happened that we were building um, this pavilion about two months ago. And the whole idea about the pavilion was how do you do architecture without a lot of preparation? You know, how do you do architecture kind of like almost on the fly? You know, um, how it can be informal, it can be done quick, um, and it can be done by basically almost anyone. And so we kind of latched onto this idea and figured this is something that we can actually spread, you know, throughout our archipelago. And so it's something that can be scaled up. It's something that can be built without much machinery or equipment or even manpower. And so that's how it kind of all started. Okay, so this is something that can be replicated anywhere uh, throughout the country. Yes, actually it's being, we, the Philippines is actually about 7,000 islands. And so it's being done all over. I mean, I think in various islands um, in our country, we ourselves, we've, bit, we've built about 1,200 beds. And outside our group, I think another 800 beds have been built. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a lot. That's that's amazing. And you said that that you were thinking uh, about you know architecture without much preparation or architecture you know that basically anyone can build. So I wonder um, these sort of like short-term relief spaces. How are they sort of changing the dynamics of the industry at the moment? And I think we've been used to having architecture as a very um, stagnant, you know, kind of like very static thing, right? It's always very dominant. It's something that takes much time and preparation. Um, it's always a major endeavor. So we've been thinking how you know, society has been changing so fast and how our lifestyles, you know, we're always about a quick and um, convenient even. And so I think architecture in a way must change with our times and be something that is more accessible. It's almost like the difference between your basic desktop or laptop computer, your mobile mm -hmm. phone. You know, the difference in terms of like scale and convenience is there. And so we've been working on ideas about that for the past few years, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, obviously architecture, I mean, I don't know if you agree, but it's, it's, it's basically a discipline of problem solving. But then I think mm -hmm. it, it, somehow in the last maybe few decades or so, it is basically principally revolved around the idea of aesthetics. And I wonder if COVID-19 can change that balance. Um, I think it's certainly an opportunity for us to show, you know, the different sides of architecture. I think architecture has kind of like um, been dispersed into different um, specialties, if you may. And I think right now with the limited manpower, um, logistic problems and all that, I think um, we're being forced to reimagine how architecture can do things, you know, on its own even. Mm -hmm. and so I think, yeah, I think it's the right time to change things. Okay, so, yeah, that sounds hopeful. Do you think that this is all going to be relevant after the pandemic is over, these short-term relief spaces and architecture without much effort and all that? Or, mm -hmm. or do you think what should be done uh, about our healthcare systems and architecture when it comes to the long-term perspective? I, we, our, our office has actually been working on this idea um, called social architecture. And our idea is that um, we're going to be building spaces that are, that are more socially intimate. 
which means we're trying to juxtapose you know our relationship with our buildings instead of us having to go to every building for example going to church we have to bring these buildings to us um the other idea is to remove barriers uh, you know increase accessibility um create freedom of movement in our structures and also to build in a social scale meaning we feel that all our public um buildings should have a function of connecting or lubricating you know um our social life mm. and instead of just focusing on the human scale i think we should actually also imagine how architecture can help you know bring us all together as a community mm. and so we this is actually like the third or fourth iteration of that project actually but is it a good time to think about socially intimate buildings and environments <laughs> i think once we give up on our society then we've lost the battle and so we feel like it's also our job as architects to figure out how we can actually build something for the community that would still have a semblance of community you know i think society has to be kept together regardless of how you know the pandemic affects us okay okay well let's see how it all turns out thank you so much for joining us on showcase today For many fortunate to stay at home, returning to work can seem like a newfound challenge. And for architect Arjun Kaka, our office space could use some big changes. Hi, so tell us about these changes. I mean, do you think that, first of all, do you think that uh, uh, our workplaces is sort of the biggest challenge that architectural world is facing at the moment? I think that the workplace is one of the largest uh, uh, areas that is really challenging us at the moment. I think there's also residential, uh, retail, obviously hospitality. There are huge challenges in that as well. But I think workplace really is a huge challenge for us mm -hmm. architects at the moment and for the occupiers of the buildings. Okay, in what way is it a challenge? I mean, the way that we've sort of built workspaces is just not working anymore, is it? That's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a real trend in the last 20 years uh, towards creating more efficiency in offices. And mm -hmm. that basically means putting more people into the same space. There's also been another really huge trend, which is increasing collaboration in the office, really seeing the office as the uh, primary way to get staff to communicate, collaborate with each other. And both of these things are uh, very difficult to do now, mm -hmm. uh, effectively, in this post-COVID world. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't fit as many people into the offices, and we can't encourage collaboration as much. Okay, so what are you going to be doing? I mean, first idea, I mean, first speculation, the, the most popular speculation is that we're going to be uh, having, you know, more home offices. Do you think that's likely? Absolutely. I think that this is something that's different for every organization and really for every individual within the organization. Uh, what, one of the things that uh, I've been talking to clients about is doing what we call a work style appraisal for staff to really find out from every staff whether that's through a Zoom interview or whether that's through an online survey find out what the experience of working from home was like, mm -hmm. whether it was a positive one or negative one, mm -hmm. whether they feel that they were more productive or less productive, more stressed or less stressed, mm -hmm. more able to collaborate with their colleagues or less able. And from that to work out really who is best suited to come back into the office and who's best suited to, to stay at home. And then to reorganize and redesign the office based on that. Mm -hmm. For some companies, it might be 90% of people coming back into the office. For others, it might be 90% staying at mm home. -hmm. So that is the real challenge for the workplace at the moment, to, to readdress that work from home, work from office balance effectively. Mm -hmm. And does it change from industry to industry? I mean, what is the sort of uh, feedback you're getting from the clients? I mean, can you share it uh, with us a little? Well, we're actually finding that surprisingly within even the same industries, 
there are very, mm. very different cultures and very, very different demographics of staff. And uh, also just where, where people live is very different. So a, a company that has, uh, that's in a geographical location where their staff are able to live in larger places, Mm -hmm. And often we find that it's easier for them to work from home. But in more, but but where the staff live in more dense uh, urban uh, accommodation, that can be more tough. If you're if you're sharing a very small property with a lot of people, then working from home really is often less of an option. Mm -hmm. So by the sounds of it, I mean we might be expecting smaller offices and larger offices as well. It really depends on how much of uh, the workers are you know, coming back to the office, right? That's absolutely right. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of sort of musical chairs with the office accommodation. I think we're suddenly going to find that a lot of uh, companies are going to need more space and then others are going to need less. So there's going to be this real churn in office accommodation. Um, yeah. Do you think that open open uh, plan offices will survive though? I mean, dep- it doesn't really matter whether they're smaller offices or not. Do you think that plan is sort of sustainable? I think open plan offices are going to change. Mm. Uh, they are going to uh, be less open and transparent. Okay. So they are they're going to be more screens between desks. Mm-hmm. There might be more partitions between departments. There might also be more offices as well uh, within them. Mm-hmm. Another thing that's going to happen is they're going to become less dense okay. because there's because we can fit less people in. Mm-hmm. I think desks are going to get larger as well. Mm-hmm. People are going to have more space in open plan than they have before than they had before, and that could be good for people because one of the biggest complaints with open plan has been people feeling they have too little space, there's too much distraction, there's too much noise, they can't concentrate on their work effectively. And I think that in future, this might be less the case. So it might actually be better open plan environments for people. Okay, so I think one challenge, uh, it sounds like, is maintaining social distancing whilst uh, encouraging social interaction. Do, Do you think this sounds like something that the architects will have to play with? Absolutely. Um, So one of the big trends has been in the workplace to try to encourage spontaneous chance collaboration. Mm -hmm. That water cooler moment, moment, they call it, where two people who might not even know each other chat to each other and come up with an idea and get to talk in a way they would not otherwise talk. And that that is something we're going to see much less of, I think. I think a lot more encounters are going to be planned. They're not going to be so spontaneous. And I think that's a real challenge for organizations who want people to talk, not just with people within their own team, but across teams, across departments. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be a real challenge because going forward, there's going to have to be less of that. And so we're going to have to find techniques that still get people to talk to a wide range of people in the workplace, even if they can't do that face to face as much. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to to see how the office culture evolves. I mean, obviously, when I go back to the office, Arjun Keika, it was good to have you. Thanks. Thank you. So let's take a look into the future and how the coronavirus may have changed architects' minds in how they approach design. Uh, to do that, I'm joined by Scott Francisco, founder and director of Pilot Projects Design Collective. Hi, Scott. So as I was getting ready for this interview, I read something uh, by George Ronelli, an architect, uh, and he said that the pandemic of today calls into question the dominance of a century of architecture's disregard for the history. I mean, he was talking about the international 
style movement and mm -hmm. how vernacular was almost like a pejorative term and it was seen in negative uh, light. I wonder if you feel like this COVID-19 crisis will be as strong and will sort of help us reevaluate how we approached architecture for the past couple of decades. I do think it's going to have a massive impact. Um, I think it's we're in the middle of a global experiment that is, is completely unprecedented in the way that we use space. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing about it is everyone is involved um, from the, you know, from the from the high rises in the big cities to forest communities. Um, we're all involved in this and we're all using space differently than we were two or three months ago. Mm -hmm. So that alone uh, is just a, is a massive opportunity for architects to really tune into what are the realities of uh, space use at the domestic level, at the urban level. Um, and if architects can really connect with that, I think there's an opportunity to rethink the, the priorities that architecture has. Mm -hmm. And so one example of that would be open space. Mm -hmm. uh, open space has been really one of the one of the cornerstones of the modern movement is opening everything up for yeah. more light, for more view connection. And do you think it will be is, challenged during this process? I do. I think one of the things that we're all discovering is that in a crisis like this, the flexibility and multi-use aspect of space is very important. And open space is not always conducive to that sort of mm. multi-use multi and flexible use. If we're doing an interview here and we're doing it in a home, uh, what kinds of doors can we close to allow us to, to have some, some privacy, acoustic privacy or, or otherwise? So these are things that modern spaces don't necessarily support. Mm -hmm. um, and traditional spaces in many cases are better at accomplishing that than some of the modern spaces that we've been creating. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, for example, one uh, speculation that is really popular is I think that we're going to be seeing a lot more sustainable architecture or sustainable approaches to architecture. Do you think this is likely? Yes. I do. I think another outcome of this is really focusing us on the global connectivity of all of our resources, our materials, our energy, um, our, our labor forces. All of these things are, are global these days. And so, and that's brought to the center of our attention right now. So when we're sourcing materials to build a building, I think both the, the client, the owner and the user of the building will be more tuned into that reality and the architects as well will hopefully be responding to that awareness. So if mm -hmm. we're buying wood, wood is a very popular material right now for large urban buildings for a new sustainable vision for cities. Uh, where is that wood coming from? And what are the impacts on the forests and the people that work in those forests? These are the kinds of things that architects cannot avoid any longer. And I think that's a real opportunity for architecture to play a central role in a sustainable systems uh, reboot for the world. And are we going to see skyscrapers built around, uh, you think, after this? Because I think there was a report that uh, living or working in tall uh, crowded buildings was actually mm -hmm. putting people at risk of coronavirus a lot more. So I wonder how you feel like it will be affected. I think it will. I think that that's going to take some time. But I think the we've known for quite a while that uh, very tall buildings aren't necessarily the most uh, sustainable, um, even to achieve the density that we want to achieve in cities. There's ways of doing that in mid-rise buildings where spaces are more uh, connected to the ground. Uh, there's more outdoor space uh, and just a sense of uh, connection to the street and street life. So mm -hmm. I think with with the pandemic, where if you happen to be sort of locked inside your apartment and you're 20 or 30 stories up, you really feel disconnected at that point. Yeah. So I think bringing people to the ground and providing options is, is very important. I would say that we're looking at mid-rise, high-density buildings in cities that have a very strong focus on sustainability for everyday life, that is access to, to light and air and, and plant life and, and trees. Um, in, even in the city, uh, as well as where those materials are coming from and the energy footprint of those buildings and the forest footprint of those buildings. Mm -hmm. So things like concrete and steel, which are very popular materials, have massive energy footprints. And those energy footprints are felt in our climate. So we're going to have to address those things. Okay, well, let's see what uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will bring to our lives. I mean, we know about what it's taking from us. Scott Francisco, it was good to have you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much.
Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That's it for today's homemade edition of Showcase. I'm Elif Bereketli. Bye for now.